For Inside Carolina, I'm Taylor Vipolis, and this is Up in the Rafters, where I'm joined by Carolina basketball legend and 2017 national champion Justin Jackson. Justin, the, the Drake May era for Carolina football is off to a rocking start. Carolina had the blue and white scrimmage. We're here to talk about that because there's no offseason when it comes to Carolina basketball over here at Inside Carolina. Watching the scrimmage, what were some of the biggest takeaways that you had and just overall thoughts from the day? Um, Yeah, I mean, I think first and foremost, like we had talked about previously, um, it was more of a pickup style game. Um, It wasn't very structured, I guess I would say. Um, But as as I watched it, um, you know, it was kind of some of the same takeaways that we've had. Um, R.J. Davis is really good with the ball in his hand. Um, Armando, obviously at that level just dominates any bigs that are in front of them. Um, and then Caleb Love has probably the most confidence in college basketball. Um, and, uh, you know, so I think those were good. I think it was also cool to see kind of some of the freshmen play a little bit. I think Seth, um, I think Seth watching, watching the way that he plays, I think he could give um, UNC some good minutes throughout the season, whether it's giving RJ or Caleb, a break or, you know, him actually earning some serious minutes. Um, But just kind of the way he plays, he's kind of one of those guys you can just plug him right in. Um, And then just kind of seeing some of the other guys kind of compete. Um, You know, at the end of the day, we, you know, we've talked about it, but there's got to be at least one, maybe two other guys that are able to contribute going into this next year. Um, And so just trying to see, you know, what guys have been working on their game and what guys can kind of step up going into this year. Yeah, the unofficial stats have the white team, which was Armando Baycott, R.J. Davis, Puff Johnson, DeMarco Dunn, Justin McCoy, Creighton Lebo, Dewey Farris, uh, with 80 points, beating the blue team of Caleb Love, Pete Nance, Dontre Style, Seth Trimble, Will Shaver, Jackson Watkins, and Tyler Nickel. You, you mentioned the Caleb Love aspect. He is... He is such a polarizing player because I think for the most part, every Carolina fan has kind of gotten to the point where it's like, he's going to shoot the ball and we're going to let him shoot the ball. (laughs) Is that, is that what you're kind of seeing? I think that's kind of where it's at, man. Like, and I think I would, I would rather have it that way than, you know, him being afraid to shoot the ball. You know what I'm saying? Like him having that confidence is one of the biggest reasons why they made that kind of run in the, NCAA tournament last year was because he just wasn't afraid of any moment, right? And it wasn't afraid of taking any shot, whether it was a terrible shot or it was a good shot. He stepped right into it like he'd done a million times. So, yeah, I think you you have to get to the point where, with Caleb now where it's like, look, he's proven that he can make some crazy shots. So whether he makes it or misses it, you got to kind of live with it. Yeah, sometimes you're just going to have to live with the the six second into the shot clock pull from the the North from Carolina the, logo from the logo you gotta live with it <laughs> if, if that happens one two possessions game you know there's 80 there's 80 other possessions to exactly. worry about um, this was a lot of UNC's UNC fans first chance to see somebody like Pete Nance in action what did you kind of see from him and how do you kind of see him fitting in with this core that's coming back from that night from that national title run. Yeah. I mean, I think um, it's hard to replace somebody like Brady and what he brought to the team last year for them, um, especially from like the outside shooting perspective. But when you watch Pete and I got to play against him one, I guess one day while I was back at school, um, when you watch him, he's such a uh, kind of along the same lines with Seth. It's kind of somebody that you can just put in there and he's going to, you know, do whatever he needs to do with whatever, players are out there with him you know whether you know you saw it a lot of times he was kind of you know he would get the ball at the top of the key and initiate some sort of action or you know he showed that he can you know put the ball on the floor and make some sort of plays or obviously everybody knows he can shoot the ball pretty well he's got you know athleticism that kind of thing but just kind of seeing with what you know this team has as far as RJ and Caleb and even Armando down low just somebody that can come in and create some sort of action so that it's not the offense doesn't get stagnant defensively. They've got somebody that can, you know, protect the rim with Armando. 
Um, so I, I think I, I am very interested to see once the season goes kind of what he can do, um, you know, for this team, but I think he's going to be huge for him. Yeah. I was, I was impressed with um, Nance's mid range game. I was kind of hoping to see how for, he was on the same team as Will Shaver. So Will Shaver was the one matched up against Baycott. I kind of wanted to see how Nance would do faring um, against Baycott because no offense to, to Shaver, but Shaver just was outmatched going up against somebody like Armando Baycott, who a lot of people probably have as a, a consensus preseason All-American type player. When you look at the the true freshman, who do you think contributes more this season, Tyler Nickel or Seth Trimble? Because I think they both showed pretty good flashes with – Trimble's ability as a guard or, or Nichols ability to hit that outside shot. Yeah. I mean, I think um, with Seth, I think it's all going to depend on kind of how coach wants to, you know, move him in with the minutes that RJ and Caleb are going to, you know, need to have rest. Um, I think that's just kind of the situation for him. I think if it were just overall, I feel like Seth would probably, um, you know, deserve more minutes, but with Tyler and his shooting ability being kind of a bigger wing, um, to be honest, I think he could maybe move right into, you know, one of those spots on the wings that really, you know, plays some consistent minutes. Um, I think once again, it just kind of depends on how puff plays, um, you know, how DeMarco plays, how, you know, all of those guys play, um, going into this season, you know, in the off season and preseason. Um, Cause once again, there's gotta be, you know, one or two other guys that step up, you know, right now you've got RJ, Caleb and Leakey. That's kind of the, you know, those are the the guards and the wings that we have right now. So who else is going to be able to step up? And, you know, obviously Tyler's shown that he can spread the floor a little bit and shoot the ball. And, um, you know, Seth's shown that he can, you know, cause some problems defensively and then get into the paint. So, We'll see. We'll see what kind of what you know, Coach Davis wants to do with with what with with their minutes. Yeah, I think the answer to that question would probably be who who shows more of a consistent threat from the outside because RJ does a great job in the pick and roll, getting downhill. You have somebody like Caleb Love, who I thought Caleb on Saturday looked really good, getting downhill and attacking the basket, and then it's just. Who, who could kind of help space the floor? And I think that's where somebody like Tyler Nickel, like you mentioned, can can step right in. I have to address it. Tyler Nickel's voice. Thoughts on Tyler Nickel's voice. Hey, because, look. because when I first saw it, because I don't, I, Inside Carolina does such a good job with recruiting. Uh, Sherelle does such a good job with recruiting that I almost let, him do everything when it comes to recruiting and once players are on campus that's the first time I'm really like yeah. learning about them the first time he was on a TikTok or an Instagram video my jaw dropped to the ground because I did not see that voice coming hey uh Tyler first time I ever met him he said what's up and I uh it was one of those you had to kind of do a double take like <laughs> wait hold on. um but yeah I mean look that's uh you know Kenny, I guess, would be the first, you know, guy to step up and say that's the VA, right? Like the, I don't know, man. I mean, I, I respect it. I mean, he's got that, that very white type voice, you know. So, um, yeah, I respect it. Hopefully, you know, his voice and his game can translate into, you know, some big minutes for us. Yeah, if they put together uh, like a singing type group, maybe at at late night. He's got that baritone voice. Down. Definitely has He's that. Got... He's perfect for that. <laughs> the the other takeaway that I had from the scrimmage, you you kind of mentioned it when you were talking about R.J. Davis, but his his ability to score the basketball, it it almost looks effortless at this point. Uh, from the unofficial stats, he was the leading scorer, twenty four points, nine of eighteen, three of eight from three. Uh, two assists, five rebounds, two steals. He's somebody who who can kind of do it all. Where do you see his development going this season, and and what kind of impresses you from R.J. Davis's game? Because I think a lot of the times he 
in terms of last year, he does get overlooked for what he did for the team's turnaround where he's probably the most important player, but from a outside perspective, he's probably the, the fourth or fifth storyline that you talk about from that team. Yeah. I mean, it's, um, it's tough because he honestly is probably, you know, besides Armando, he's probably the most consistent player for, for UNC. Um, the thing about headlines, man, is like, you don't write necessarily about the guys who are just, you know, consistent the whole way through, right. You, you write about, um, people that go crazy in the tournament or somebody that hits a crazy shot or, you know, those kind of players. Um, so I think that's why he kind of gets overlooked, but to be honest, man, like playing pickup against him and seeing him play in, in these few games, um, scoring the ball wise, I think he's, he's got it all. Like he, he can score off pick and roll. He can score, you know, off the ball, um, he just knows how to score. There's some players that play basketball that just, I don't know what it is, but it's just God given. They just know how to put the ball in the basket. And RJ has that. So um, hopefully he can continue being this aggressive and continue to be, you know, assert himself this much offensively uh, once the season starts, because I think that's just going to take everybody else's game even to a whole other level. Then Caleb won't necessarily have to shoot from the logo every single time because they're going to have to be worried about RJ getting down to him or Mondo's not going to have two or three guys coming to, you know, trap him when he gets the ball on the block, because when you trap him, you're leaving a guy like RJ open or, you know, a guy like Caleb open. So hopefully, you know, hopefully he can, you know, continue this, this aggressiveness. And I'm sure coach Davis is kind of, you know, every day instilling that type of confidence and encouraging to play the way that he's playing. Yeah. The trajectory from RJ Davis, he, had that reserve role his freshman year, kind of adjusting to the college game. Last year, he obviously breaks out once the offense starts running more through him. And I think it's I think it's something that fans can kind of forget that like coming out of high school, RJ Davis was the the all time leading scorer in, in Westchester County, where they've produced a ton of great basketball players. And I think you're seeing that more and more with with his ability to make it look effortless, putting the ball in the basket. And you, you said you don't know what it is with players like R.J. Davis. Uh, I, Come I on. Was it's the New York. It's the New I York. Knew this was coming. <laughs> I knew this was coming. You don't have it, so I don't know why you're saying it's the New York. But he does, bro. He's got what it is, New York, whatever it is. He's is. He's got that that ability, bro. It's kind of, it's kind of wild. That is recapping the – Blue white scrimmage. The white team wins, led by R.J. Davis, twenty-four points. Armando Baycott with nineteen points, leading scorer on the blue team. Caleb Love, twenty-two. Pete Nance and Tyler Nickel with eleven, and Seth Trimble with twenty-one. We're gonna take questions from the mailbag of Inside Carolina subscribers. L underscore Tar Heel said, "What made you stick with UNC?" despite everything that was kind of going around with UNC at the time with, with the whole NCAA scandal and, and that kind of cloud hanging over the program? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, for, for us, Coach, Coach Williams did a good job of, you know, every time we talked to him, he kept on reiterating that it wouldn't affect us when we were at school. Um, and when I say we, obviously, Theo and Joel coming in with me. Um, and so we – you know, we just stayed true to what, what we said we were going to do. We said we were going to go to UNC and, you know, try to make something happen there. And um, obviously it all worked out, but that's kind of what kept us, you know, secured and locked into UNC was because of Coach Williams, um, you know, continuing to tell us that nothing was going to, you know, happen to us Um you know, or affect us and our experience when we went to UNC. So that's kind of what it was. This guy's got a lot of numbers in his name, so I'm not even going to try to read it out. But he asked, do the players ever hate Duke as much as the fans do? <laughs> um, this is going to hurt a lot of fans' hearts, but no, players don't. Players usually do not um, hate Duke. Uh, 
even really that much, um, except for like game days, obviously. Like game days, it's like, okay, we're really trying to beat Duke. Um, there might there might be a player or two on their team that maybe we don't like. Um, it just kind of rubs us the wrong way. But for the most part, it's, it's all fans that have the hate for Duke, um, which that's what makes the rivalry. So continue doing that. But for the players, we just – Unless we're playing against them, we really don't we don't care too much. Yeah, I think the players don't have to hate Duke as long as they just understand the magnitude of exactly. of the rivalry and how much hate there is from the fans. Exactly. Right. Because they got plenty of it. Yeah. <laughs> the the fans have enough hate for everybody. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um the next question I had was from Tario eight seven eight. How much talking is going on in in games like the Kentucky game he mentioned? It looked like there was a lot of back and forth chirping at each other. Uh, who's doing the talking from from your North Carolina teams, and how much talking is there on the court? Honestly, man, there wasn't too much talking. We had a lot. We had a lot of guys, me included, that. If the other team started talking and they started kind of jawing, then that kind of got us going a little bit. Um, and that's kind of what you saw in the Kentucky game. Um, but for the most part, we really didn't have a lot of guys that, you know, really talked a lot. Um, I'm trying to think because I don't really – Joel maybe when he got fired up. Um but for the most part, we didn't. We just went out there and handled our business. We didn't really talk too much. Now there are some players that that's almost all they know to know to do is to talk, um, and those are the guys that get would always get us going and get us fired up. So, um, you know, shout out to those guys for for getting us going. In the pickup games, who who would you say is is the biggest talker? I I can imagine <laughs> it being Cole Anthony. Cole, <laughs> Cole. Last time I played against Cole, Cole was probably the biggest. Um, he probably was the biggest talker in pickup. Um, it's funny because, like, guys guys don't necessarily talk trash. Um, but they don't necessarily talk trash to one another, right? But they'll talk just in general. Yeah. You know, like, they get a bucket, it's like a – like. I'm that guy or, you yeah. know what I'm saying? Like, it's that kind of, it's that kind of talking. Yeah. Um, a lot of Cole, I'm hymns. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if there was any I'm hymns to be honest. Cause I think that would have been shut down quick. Uh, <laughs> but Cole definitely Cole's got that. Uh, he's got that edge to him, bro. So he definitely talks a little bit. Yeah. I could see that from his, uh, his personality on social media and the, the TikToks where he's, he's going after, uh, Carmelo Anthony's son. <laughs> he's just he's just out there playing. No volleyball. mercy. Yeah. No mercy. The last question I have from the Inside Carolina Premium subscribers. It's L underscore Sordo. He said, "What do you think the most impressive in-game coaching move was from Hubert Davis this past year? Like, what really impressed you from a X's and O's type perspective?" X's and O's. I think I think strategy wise, him down the stretch, um, which it kind of came back to bite him a little bit towards the end, but him shortening the rotation, um, I think was big. Um, you know, it gets to a point kind of where you just have to put the players out there that are producing for you. Um, and so I think him doing that was big. I think, like you had said previously, putting the ball in RJ's hand a little bit more offensively um, and letting Caleb play off the ball and kind of, um, you know, get involved that way, I think was big for the team um, because RJ does get downhill so well, his shooting ability coming off, coming off screens. Um, it just causes problems for the defense. Um, so I think that's kind of, if I had to pick one, that's probably the biggest, the biggest um, uh, takeaway when it comes to, big time moves X's and O's wise that coach Davis did, but there's so many little things that, you know, to the normal, normal fan, they wouldn't even see that coach Davis did. 
um, that really helped them down the stretch. Um, so, you know, I'm looking forward to this year and kind of seeing, obviously, their amazing run last year and almost getting it done, uh, just seeing kind of if they can continue that momentum, um, you know, even with all the hype and stuff that they've they've got this year. That's all we have this week on Up in the Rafters. Tomorrow, Saturday, North Carolina football travels on the road at App State. Carolina's a one-and-a-half-point underdog. What I need you to make your official prediction. What's Drake May doing in this first road start? First road start, I'm going to give him three touchdowns. I'm going to say 21 for 32. Okay. Um, 230 yards. Most importantly, is he is he coming back to Chapel Hill with the win? Yeah, of course. <laughs> that's not even that's not even part of the question. That's that's a given. He's got to come back with the win, um, and he's going to go to class at 8 a.m. the next morning, like his brother did. So he's, he's on Monday. Make, uh, oh, on, Monday's a holiday. On, so Tuesday on, on Tuesday. Tuesday on Tuesday he's going to show up at 8 a.m. God, I forgot it's Labor Day weekend. Yeah. You know, you know, if he wins that game, there's gonna be, there's gonna be like screenshots of Luke, screenshots of Drake, people carrying, Everywhere. people carrying Drake into class. For his eight, <laughs> he might not even have an eight a.m. He's gonna show up for. An He's gonna a. show up at, at a random eight a.m. Not even knowing what class it is, but just to do it. Well, Justin, appreciate the time. Appreciate everybody for listening. And we will be back next week for the Up in the Rafters podcast. Thank you, everybody, for listening.